Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Ryan Klom and I'm a Dean Student Ambassador and Public Affairs Student Assistant at the UC Riverside School of Public Policy. I will be serving as the MC for today's webinar with our distinguished guest, City of Riverside Council Member Clarissa Cervantes. This webinar is brought to you by the UCR School of Public Policy, as well as its Dean's Band Ambassadors. My peers and I are delighted to host this event and provide this service to the general community. Before we get started, I wanna first go over the format of today's online seminar. We will first devote the first hour of today's event to our presentation by our guest speaker. I will reserve the last half an hour of today's event for an audience Q&A. For that Q&A, I will have also invited my fellow public policy classmates to ask questions on camera directly to our guests. Audience members, if you have any questions you would not like, or if you would like me to pose during the Q&A session, please do not send them in the chat, but send them via the Q&A feature instead, which you can see at the bottom of your screens. You can submit your questions anytime throughout the event via the Q&A feature, and you do not have to wait for the audience Q&A portion of today's event to send in your questions. Now, at this point, it is my honor to introduce our guest speaker. Councilmember Clarissa Cervantes was elected on June 8th of 2021. She is a mother and lifelong Riverside County resident, and she is also the first woman to be elected to represent Ward 2, as well as the second Latina and second openly LGBTQ plus elected official on the Riverside City Council. Prior to her election, she was a legislative field representative for former Ward Council member Andy Meldrez, and she also served as an organizer for the SEIU 121 RN, representing over 8,500 registered nurses and other healthcare professionals in Riverside County throughout Southern California. She's earned her bachelor's degree in political science from Cal State Northridge and has also earned a master's degree in urban and regional planning from Cal Poly Pomona. Council Member Cervantes, we're so delighted and honored to have you with us today. I will now hand it over to you for your presentation. Hello, good evening. Thank you, community. I am so honored and grateful to be here today. I want to begin by thanking the UCR School of Public Policy Thank you for the invitation to be a speaker tonight in the seminar. And I wanna thank the students. We have a wonderful group of students this evening who have been active and diligent in working with my office and even other offices to host these seminars and these series that are truly impactful and allow for community to learn and hear one-on-one -on -one from their elected representatives and uh, people who are advocating and working for them across the Inland Empire. So I thank you for the work you are doing um, and your leadership. And with that, I'm going to take about 10 minutes and I am just looking down because I have a stopwatch <laughs> to keep myself on track. But I wanted to share a little bit about my history and my story of how I ca came to be council member and Clarissa today. Um, before I share my PowerPoint and a little bit about now my time in office and you know what I'm working on as a council member. And my bio uh, highlighted some of my history, and I'm going to walk you guys through a little bit of that because I think it's important and it gives context to who I am and how I ultimately ended up deciding to run for Riverside City Council and represent War II. Uh, for myself, I was born out in the Coachella Valley. I was actually born in Indio, and I grew up in uh, the city of Coachella at a young age on a ranch. My grandparents on my father's side have been here in Riverside County since 1920. And that is where my grandmother was born. And um, we still have that ranch to this day. And the ranch and my grandparents on my father's side really rooted me into the importance of community, as well as with my mother's side. Um, she actually came over and migrated from Mexico with her, her mother and her uh, siblings when she was an infant, she was a baby. So she came over to the United States when she was four years old and later went on to become a citizen when I was eight years old, along with my grandparent, my grandmother and my uncles, my tios and tias. Um, but truly my story is also a story of being a product of migration and um, the beauty of how when, you know, being in, my mother being an immigrant and coming in, into this country, and her daughters now being able to be two elected representatives of the greater community of Riverside. I don't think they, she ever could have dreamed that this would be um, her story of having daughters who are now fighting for communities that we love. And so uh, for myself, I, I always mention the pillars of who helped me become who I am today. Um, at a very young age, I 
I grew up actually helping my grandparents out on the ranch. Um, it was part of our responsibility that they taught us to tend to the land, to protect the land, and to protect the people who, who were cultivating the land, and that was our farm working community. So growing up out on a very secluded ranch in Coachella, um, my sister became my best friend, and that is now assembly member Sabrina Cervantes. And my two younger, our two younger sisters came uh, just a couple years later. So I have three sisters. So there's four, four girls, and we all, everyone always teases my dad about it. <laughs> he got all daughters, but um, for myself, growing up on that ranch, my my closeness, my family were the people who were closest to me. And I'm very blessed to have a big family on both sides. So I have lots of cousins and lots of tios and tias, uncles and aunts. And they really all, we taught, at least I witnessed and was grateful that my parents were always community public servants. Um, my, one of my earliest memories was actually my father running for city council and for mayor of Coachella. So my father is also, was also previously a public servant. And here's the kicker. When I was young, I used to say, I never want to be a council member. <laughs> That's because meetings, I always had to go to meetings with him, and they were so boring to me at the time. Look at me now. <laughs> and it's just kind of funny. I, I share that. I don't think I've actually ever shared that with anyone, with you know, community before, is that it's really funny when we're younger and we look sometimes at our parents and be some, I don't know if anyone's ever said, I don't want to be like that. But I am so proud to be now following in um, the essence of the footsteps of my father, who is a public servant, and also my mother, who's a public school teacher. And she's been an educator at the same school now for over 30 years in the city of Coachella. And she was always and taught me the importance of civil rights and justice. So every summer, I was actually given a summer project at home, and it was to explore and look into what civil rights leaders are empowering to you. Um, how about who, who inspires you? And so for myself at a young age, I was, um, I was diving into the history books on Martin Luther King Jr., Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta. And these are the stories. These are the people who inspired me. And what's, what's also amazing is when I was young, I used to think, I would tell my mom, I missed my opportunity. I was supposed to be their mom. I was supposed to march on Washington. I was supposed to be part of that movement. I could feel it in me. And she would, tell, she would look at me and say, you are in, here born in the time that you are meant to be, and you will make the difference in this time and now, and we need you now here today. And she, without even, I think, realizing it, was so correct and right. Um, to now be marching in fighting for social justice and causes and issues that we're still fighting for today that our parents and even grandparents were fighting for back in the, the 40s, 50s, 60s, those are still existing right now. And so I mentioned that as well because social, social justice are our, our leaders who have been um, these people, these figures these were people who inspired me as well and who activated me at a very young age to believe that I could make a difference in my community. And so when I started getting older, you know, I grew up, went to elementary school, went to middle school. And then when I got to high school, I, I'm going to be very honest and transparent where I was always excelling in school at a young age. And I was able to receive different awards for getting good grades. Um, or I was a big reader. I love reading. So I always was a, uh, the, what was it, book reading champion of the month. <laughs> but when I actually got to high school, I was feeling conflicted at that time in my life. And I was actually going through a hard time and um, I was in depressed. I was depressed. I had fell into a stage of actually being depressed and um, I was suicidal. For, for several years of my life when I was young. And I mentioned this right now, and something told me inside today that it is so important for us to talk about mental health at all ages and all stages, no matter where, because we sometimes look at people and we think that they've made it and that it must have not been hard or that they must have figured out another way. But I want people to know that the only reason I believe I was partially able to figure out a way out of high school was because I had two mentors who saw me and saw that something was wrong and they reached out to me. 
And one of them was a wrestling coach. His name was Tom Jenkins. Um, rest in peace. He passed away from cancer several years ago, but he saw that I was troubled and he just called me into his office one day and he was the ASD advisor. So he actually asked me, um, he looked into my grades and met with my counselor and did, they decided that one of the best things for me would be to be involved in ASB, which is student government. And, you know, he offered me the opportunity and said, if you want to turn your life around, I want you to show up tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. and be here for zero period. And I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what, why they wanted me to show up, but I showed up and it changed my life. I was then able to be involved and have friends around me who were involved in the school, who cared, um, who were just interested in different things, but that we actually were interested in them as alignment, the same thing as well. And it really changed how I felt as a person and my value and in people seeing me and in people not, not looking at me on, and putting me on the sidelines and realizing that even though Clarissa shows up and she seems happy and joyous, there were adults who saw that there was something else bothering me and they didn't ignore it. And that other person was Dr. Farrah Meadows. Um, she is still an educator today out in the Coachella Valley and she is an inspiration to me. And she also really held my hand and my soul while I was journeying through these, these battles that were tearing me apart inside. Um, but they were the two that actually helped me to pick up because I went from being an, an, a star A academic student to to basically failing out and I wasn't gonna be able to go to college. And they both said, you have to go to college. And I had my parents telling me how to go to college too, but um, I didn't wanna listen to them. <laughs> so I needed somebody else to see me and they saw me and they didn't give up on me. So by the time it was senior year, I was able to pick up my GPA and I was able to apply to colleges for Cal States. Um, actually now to share my history, my family, my father went to UCR, my older sister went to UCR, and then I was the second born, so there was an expectation I would go to UCR, but I actually didn't have the GPA. And I was so ashamed at the time and so sad about it, but it led me to Cal State Northridge, which I'm so happy that I believe that's where I was actually supposed to be and end up because that is the college where I went and the, that changed my life. So I'll now jump ahead to, I've been able to graduate from high school and I decide to pursue political science. So I enroll at Cal State Northridge, um, which is in the outskirts of Los Angeles, for those who may not be familiar. And I, my first two years in, uh, I start working full time because for myself and my family, which some people may also resonate with, unfortunately, my parents, even though they had, they each had degrees, even though they both had two good paying jobs, they had, because they had four daughters and my older sister, Sabrina, just graduated from UCR, college is so expensive, they didn't have enough money to send me and pay for my full tuition. So I had to start working and I didn't want my little sisters to struggle the way I was struggling. So I took it upon myself to work two jobs while taking 18 units. And it actually really created a stressful, a stressful living, I think, several years for me, um, overworking myself because I was trying to provide for not only myself, but for my family. And so I worked at Hallmark. I would go to Subway from 5.30 a.m. till 3.30 p.m. I'd get in my car. I would drive to the local mall out there, to Topanga Mall. I would change and then I'd go work from Hallmark from, I think it was like 5 p.m. till 10 p.m. closing. I'd go home, do my homework, fall asleep at 2 a.m. and then wake up and do it again. And it was, there was some days too that even that felt unbearable and I couldn't figure out how are people living like this? You know, how are people getting by? How are they able to survive? And so I think at, even at that age too, I started thinking to myself, how can we make things better for people? How can we make college more affordable? How can we make rent more affordable? How can we make it so people don't have to work so hard just to try to get their higher education? And for myself, after I got my um, bachelor's at Cal State Northridge, um, I decided to come to Riverside because there was a job opportunity and it was in voter registration. And I had uh, in my college time, I, I forgot to mention this, but when I was at Kelsey Northridge, I thought my first job working in the political field was actually going door to door in LA. And I was part of different campaigns for LAUSD school board races. 
So I had a chance to get that first door to door experience out in Los Angeles, which is very unique. I mean, every neighborhood's unique, but um, I think what, what really has given me this broad, unique perspective is that I have knocked on doors from almost all of LA County and Riverside County, like across cities. And that has really allowed me to see how different our communities are all across Southern California, even California. And so after um, working in that, those races, I came to Riverside for the voter registration drive that changed my life. And I had a chance to work with my older sister, Sabrina Cervantes, and we led a drive with 20 people that registered 20,000 new people to vote here in Riverside County. That voter registration drive changed the, changed the representation that we still see today. We were able to have, have Senator General Richard Roth become elected, Congressman Mark Ticano, Assemblymember Jose Medina. Those three came in and shifted the representation of the uh, Inland Empire. And then I had the blessing to go to be asked if I could come in and work for Councilmember Andy Melendrez. So by saying yes to one opportunity, another door just opened for me that I had no idea was ever going to happen. And then um, after working and on the ground, essentially organizing and trying to get people to believe in the power of voting. And here's also a big piece is we still have so much apathy. There's still so many people that don't believe in the power of their vote. And that was the biggest thing that I found when I would go door to door was people saying, my vote doesn't matter. They don't care about us. And I was the, fret, the face having to tell people, yes, someone cares about you. I do. That's why I'm here. I care about you. I want you to vote so that your family has someone who's fighting for you that's going to make a difference. And so I think all those conversations and all the faces that I met throughout my journey, they stayed with me. And so when I came to work for Councilman Andy Melendrez, I had the blessing of actually representing War Two as a legislative field representative. And that uh, opportunity for three years opened my eyes to what local government can do in terms of transforming neighborhoods and cities. I had no idea the capabilities that the city of Riverside had being its own utility, having our water. I mean, it's, it's amazing the connections that we have with the Gage Canal, that we have with our um, sustainable you know, energies, with, with the, the Green Belt. There's so much here that we have in a city that doesn't exist in even other parts of the world. And I realized like Riverside is this like powerful necu the, this um, space that really is growing and, and people, it's, a, it's attracting people. People want to live here. And this is essentially the, the community that I came to call home. And I found the residents um, embracing me as family, you know, as their own as well. And so um, I fell in love with this community and this is where I've chosen to raise my daughter and my older sister and I have always usually lived within a couple of miles or you know, from each other. So having my sister out here with, and she's um, growing her family um, has really been a, a beautiful experience for me. And then I'm gonna segue really quick to kind of where my organizing with unions and then I'm gonna come back to my PowerPoint so we can jump into that and I wanna make sure I could stay on time. But uh, just to share, in 2016, I actually left Councilman Melendra's office because I wanted to continue to grow. I felt like I kind of hit somewhat of um, a, a professional space where I wanted to try new opportunities, even though I loved serving my community as a field representative. I knew I, I knew there was something calling on me to do more. And so I was able to be a director for a voter registration drive that helped to reelect Senator Richard Roth. And then I went to SCIU, Service, uh, Service Employees International Union, where I represented registered nurses. And in that profession, I had never had the opportunity to lobby. So I went from working at the local level and learning how to organize and learning how to essentially you know, work with community. I don't want to say lobby community, but you have to work with community to be able to gain support or not your or, or organized community for things we don't want to happen. Well, when I went to work for SCIU 121RN with registered nurses, it was the first time that I was able to work on now state legislation. So instead of working on local like local legislation, local policy, I was able to work on state legislation um, related to the health code. 
And that was amazing to be able to see the process of how we take registered nurses and we go to Sacramento to meet with legislators to talk about issues. And essentially my job was to empower the nurses so that they could talk about what was happening in the hospitals so that they could talk about the violations taking place. And it was, it was a lot of, it was something I'd never done. And it was a lot of work. I had over 25 hospitals in Southern California and I was the sole political organizer. So one organizer representing over 8,500 nurses. And it was a huge responsibility, but I was able to build relationships with those nurses and they ended up trusting me. So I would go into break rooms and they would tell me the problems that were happening. And then I would have to take those issues and I'd have to go back to our union. And then we would work on trying to figure out where is the loophole in this law so that this violation is happening and how can we close that loophole so that our nurses aren't at jeopardy of losing their job and that way patients are at risk of dying. So there were literally life or death issues that we were trying to address at the state level. And I'm very proud to say that we, uh, we were able to pass a bill that was uh, to address whistleblower protections. So we were able to pass a bill so that if a nurse was calling out on her on a hospital saying that this hospital is violating the state law, that nurse wouldn't be um, at risk of being fired. And we were seeing that happen time and time again. So we were able to pass the whistleblower protection, um, which was able to, to go through the state legislature and then the governor signed it. And now it's just like, I, there's a bill I worked on that the governor signed that is in text in the state of California. And I just want to share that piece of story because I don't ever talk about it, but it's so powerful. Like it's so powerful how one, one person by going out and by meeting with groups of people and letting them know that you care, you can inspire them to take action. And then they, by them showing up and taking action, we can change laws, we can change policy. Um, so I wanted to share after that experience, I went back to get my master's at Cal Poly Pomona. And I wanna mention really quickly, I was encouraged by my father to apply to the UCR School of Public Policy. And I had people in the community who actually had asked me or mentioned to me, you should apply to be part of the inaugural class. You should apply to be part of the second class. And you know, this, the, and I'm gonna say this, the UCR School of Public Policy is phenomenal, incredible. But for some reason, I just felt that there wasn't this loud yes for myself. Something wasn't saying yes to this opportunity. But when I heard about the urban regional planning a program at Cal Poly Pomona, my whole being screamed, yes, this is what I need to do. Urban planning. I want to plan communities. I want to plan my neighborhoods. I want to be able to go back to the city of Riverside and I want to be able to be that planner for the residents so that they can create the neighborhoods they want to live in. And that was what it, that's what inspired me to go back to get my planning degree. And I because I essentially thought I, I have a, I have a degree in political science. I know policy, I've lived through policy, but you know, let's go ahead and let me see if I can find another way to make a difference. And I, found, I felt that urban planning was the way for me to go. So I just wanna to share to anyone who's in the school, if this, if this is where you heard your yes, I'm so proud of you for saying yes to your opportunity to the school that was in alignment for yourself. And I want anyone on here who maybe is pursuing higher ed or is still debating what program or degree you want to go for, go with the degree that is loudly resonating within you. And it will, you, that is, that is, there is a voice within you for a reason. And so I just want to share that piece. And I'm now going to segue to my PowerPoint because I want to make sure I can go through some slides with you all. But I just want to share that in my journey, I never knew that I was going to run for city council. I never knew that I was going to end up being this position as an elected, but everything, my choices and the people who helped me along the way to see my power and to see that I can make a difference, helped me become who I am now. So when the opportunity came and when I heard that Councilman Melendres was not running for re-election, I thought I'm qualified. And I knew that I loved War II. And I just thought to myself, who else could represent and fight for war two the way that I know that I can. And there's no one else I know who's like me. And ultimately we're all our own people. We all have our own amazing abilities and, and, and capabilities, but I felt that it would actually be, a, it would be wrong for me to not put myself out 
because the community needs people who care about them. The community needs people who truly love them and love, want to show up and want to do a job that quite often we don't, there's so much more that we don't understand that comes in, that comes into play with being an elected official. And I just want the community to know that I'm so honored to be the Ward 2 council member for the city of Riverside. Um, this is one of the greatest blessings of my life. And I'm gonna go ahead and segue into a PowerPoint and talk with you a little bit more about my journey. Oh, we gotta start from the beginning. <laughs> Excuse me. Here we go. So I walked you through now a little bit about who I am and how I got here today. I am a mother, a student, a community leader. I have had the opportunity to fight for social justice, increasing participation in local, state, and national elections. Um, I actually forgot to mention, but my last most, one of my most recent elections that I was really proud to work on uh, was on the presidential campaign for Senator, Senator Elizabeth Warren. Um, and for myself, as I mentioned, my journey, um, I had a chance to earn my bachelor's degree in political science from California State University, St. Northridge, and have, I'm now completing that master's degree in urban regional planning at Cal Poly, Polytechnic Pomona. And my life as a legislative field representative, there's a nice photo here of former council member Andy Melendrez, who represented War II for 16 years, um, a long, long term elected who was continuously chosen by the community to be an advocate. And uh, that I will say that my three years working with Councilmember Melendrez really gave me insight into the neighborhoods. And I want to mention if we have any of our residents from our neighborhoods on here, University neighborhood, uh, East Side, Sycamore Canyons, um, Canyon Crest. <laughs> I was like, I'm missing one. And we even have smaller neighborhoods within our neighborhoods. We have University Knowles, we have Colony East. Um, so I want to highlight and just mention if there's any residents on here who have known me since the journey, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining today. Um, but it, being a, re a legislative field representative gave me insight into the neighborhoods and into the issues that still exist today in some of our communities. We've been able to address a great number of quality of life issues but they are ongoing. And so I think that that gave me personally an advantage when I was a candidate um, because I knew the fabric of the communities. And I actually, I've, I don't know if it's, I personally believe it is because of my connection to residents, but I also have a good memory. Um, but I still remember, you know, the names, the addresses, the homes of, of many residents who I worked with across the city. So um, when I was campaigning, I would go to those residents' homes and I would say, do you remember me? And they'd be like, of course I do, Clarissa. And I would say, of course I remember you too, Kevin Dawson, if he's on here. <laughs> but I just want to say that, um, you know, to build relationships and to have, to be able to be a legislative field representative is to be a relationship builder and to be a connector and to connect community to resources. And so I think I became, um, I think I became pretty uh, experienced in being able to address and solve quality of life issues while also being able to keep my pulse on the issues to residents um, beyond War II. I'm a, I'm a mother, I am a researcher, a community activist, and a council member now. Uh, I was honored to be sworn in on July 13th of this year for a five-year term, and it is true, I am the first woman to represent War II. I am the second Latina ever elected to the city of Riverside City Council, and I am the second openly LGBTQ plus elected and identify, I personally identify as bisexual and queer, and my pronouns are she and they. And I want to mention to folks just briefly that um, making the decision to run openly as an LGBTQ plus candidate was, was and continues to be challenging at times. Um, we are still in, we are still growing and evolving as communities. And it's really interesting that um, there are still people that will make comments that are hurtful. Um, it's unfortunate, but I've just learned that there is resiliency in being authentic. 
And there's power in being true to who you are. And I actually did not, I did not know, I, I didn't realize um, my truth of being LGBTQ plus and being bisexual and queer until my late 20s when I was able to take a queer feminist theory course and it completely changed my life, um, literally. But, you know, there was, there's been many times I want anyone to know out there who may identify with the community or may have family friends that um, you're not alone. And know that, uh, know that if you ever need support, that my, I'm here, my office is here, and that to be able to stand up and show up in your truth, you, are, you have a community out there that supports you. And I can't tell you how many people have reached out to me from the LGBT plus QIA community who have told me that you telling your story or you being honestly yourself has given me permission to be authentically myself. And so I wanna just share that, that, that with folks because sometimes I, I want you to know that there was a times, there's been times where I felt alone. There's been times where I felt like I wasn't supported as much as I wanted to be, but I'm blessed to be also an, an out um, representative with my older sister who has also felt those, those hardships and has felt sometimes the attacks. And so I'm grateful that I have her that I can sometimes call and be very raw and honest and share my emotions when, when days are hard. Um, but I want to share with folks that on the other side of hard days are happy days and are, are beautiful days where um, you know that there are people who embrace you. And we as a city and I as a city council member, I'm here to make sure that we can embrace and celebrate all the parts of who we are and all the different people who live throughout our community. Um, so I wanted just to mention that piece. Another thing that makes me unique, I believe, is that I'm a community artist, I'm a muralist, and I'm also a small businesswoman. I have my own small business that I've worked now for, well, I've had a, a joint business with another group called Mujeres Murals that we formed back in 2016 or 17, I can't remember now. And then I went on to form my own business this last year, which is Cervantes Environmental Planning and Design. And my emphasis in that is um, to be a, a community muralist that helps to transform neighborhoods, but also to serve as an, an urbanist who helps to plan communities with intention. Um, so these are two other titles and roles that I carry and I'm very proud to embody. For myself, when I think of community vision, um, I'm always thinking about developing responsibly, intentionally, as I mentioned, with art in, in art for me has to be part of a lot of that fabric of the conversation. Um, I also I always want to make sure that we are driving and pushing innovation and pushing the envelope when we think of how we can connect our residents throughout the city of Riverside. My focus when I went to get my urban planning degree was actually transportation planning and policy. So um, I'm a huge I'm a huge advocate for public transportation. And I want to see how we can strengthen our, our fabric of our public transportation network so that way we can get people out of cars and we could get them using public transportation, um, getting people on buses, getting people to use their bikes while and paired with walking and ride sharing. There are so many things that we could do to improve our air quality, but it starts with having a strong public transportation network and having a good um, a good network in general that people can move through. If you can't move through your community, if you don't feel safe or if you don't feel encouraged, you're not going to do it. And that's something that I learned firsthand. I actually had an opportunity to study abroad in Beijing uh, when I was with at Cal Poly Pomona. I lived out there for five weeks. For five weeks, I didn't have, I did not use a car to get around that entire community. And the only reason is because of how incredible their public transportation system and network was. So I want to see how we can get more to to be in the city of Riverside to be at the forefront of getting people um, to seek alternative transportation. Community revitalization. One of the things you're going to see coming in the future into down into I said down, into war two is going to be. Park Avenue revitalization. So if you're coming down University from, if you're coming down University Avenue from UCR, like you're driving into downtown, you're gonna hit Park Avenue. If you make a left on Park Avenue, this is where you're gonna see the transformation that's shown here today. 
Um, we had the opportunity, the city of Riverside, we won a grant for $30 million from the California Strategic Growth Council. That grant is, is going to be used right here in the heart of Ward 2. So what you see here in this image, we are going to bring, be bringing in bike lanes. We're going to be bringing parklets where essentially have, people have probably seen them in other cities. It is essentially an outdoor eating space for you to sit or just hang out. Uh, we're going to be adding string lighting so that, that people feel safe and that it has that nice aesthetic when you want to go out and walk around with um, your friends or your community. And we're going to have art alleys. So we already currently, Ward 2, and I think now Ward 7, a couple of the wards have, but Ward 2 actually was the pioneer that started having art alleys get implemented. And that was because we had a lot of tagging, graffiti, different things that were being put up. And residents were saying, we're sick of it. We, we need help. There needs to be a better way. And we found that by bringing art into the alleys, that art actually was left untouched. People would leave it alone. So we're going to continue to bring more art alleys in, um, and then we're going to do business makeovers. So just here's another example of a parklet. And just and the context behind the grant is that we are essentially addressing how to transform our climate communities. So this is, again, linked to active transportation, affordable housing, and ultimately creating sustainable communities. So we want to, again, encourage residents to consider their, their carbon footprint and see how they can make a difference in their communities. But it's not, it can't all be put on residents. We as government and we, again, as your electeds, have to do the work behind the scenes so that we could actually create the neighborhoods that support for people to live in those environments. And that is part of what this grant does. So here's a here are some pictures of Park Avenue today. You could see that, just so you guys know, Park Avenue, the east side is over 100 years old. So some of these buildings have been here for decades. And you could see, you know, the wear and tear, of course, over time. And um, some of these business owners are first time small business owners. And a lot of them have just have not had opportunity or funding to improve the outside of their businesses. But with the business makeover that we're going to do, we want to bring and see this type of environment, colorful, inviting, bright, um, the types of spaces that make people excited to visit. And I, I said, I want UCR students to be able to say like, hey, you guys want to go down, walk down Park Avenue? And, you know, and it's like that having that kind of idea or language is what changes how people feel about parts of their neighborhoods. And so there hasn't always been maybe, you know, the the businesses here haven't had that opportunity for someone to say like, hey, yeah, let's go walk down, you know, downtown and go shop. We want residents to say, you know, look at Park Avenue University and and think intentionally. These are this is the space that I want to support. These are the, the places that I feel called to. We have one business that we recently transformed. You could see here at the, the front, this is Park Avenue. It's a Polynesian restaurant. And uh, our local artist in residency, Juan Navarro, he donated time and worked with residents and the business owner to transform the restaurant. And this is it currently today. The bottom mural is now complete. You can actually go there and see this in person. The business owner has said that since the transformation of the, his storefront, he has increased his business, if not double, more than three times with just people walking in out of curiosity. And then we also have the Arcy's mural project that took place. Um, this was a, a project that was in partnership with the Riverside Art Museum. And here are several pictures of the artists, all that were selected. And um, most of them are local here to Riverside, which is fantastic. So we're giving right local artists in the city of arts and innovation, we're giving them an opportunity to be able to showcase their art and to be able to tell community that is my art in my neighborhood or my community. I was able to be a part of it. And so here's a beautiful mural that people are always taking photos in front of. Um, and this is also located right in the corner of Park Avenue and University. Next slide. And our newest community mural has was just placed um, over off of, it's by Habanero Mexican Grill. I can't remember the cross street right now. Um, but this was actually sponsored by Verizon. And Juan Navarro, this is a photo of me and Juan. Um, but the mural says in Spanish, the translation is, be kind to yourself today. And so 
it really is just an empowering positive message that we wanted residents when they go out into their community that they that they remember to be kind to themselves and I could, the goal and the intention is you know if, if we're kind to ourselves then and if we love ourselves then we are going to love the we're going to be kinder to the people around us and so we, we wanted something that would again empower people in the community as they're just walking around and going about their day i did want to share with folks my regional appointments um, so when you become a council member you actually get assigned to some regional county appointments um, we have a number of boards that that council members belong to and the ones that I was appointed to, um, I actually asked if I could be part of the Awamanza Industrial Growth Association. I am the lead member for that one. And then we also have the Riverside Neighborhood Partnership. I am the alternate. Council member Edwards is the main member. So when she's not able to attend, I attend on her behalf uh, or their behalf. And then the Riverside Model Deaf Community Committee. Um, this is also Council member Fierro is the lead member and I am the alternate. And I want to share with folks I actually requested to be part of the model deaf community committee, because when I went to Cal State Northridge, that was a that Cal State Northridge is the second. Um, I think it, it still may be today when I attended, it was the second deaf deaf school in the nation. So it, they have a phenomenal deaf uh, program there for our deaf, uh, deaf studies and students in general. But um, I was essentially immersed into a community where I had friends who were deaf. And I, when I was going to college at that time, I took ASL one to four so that I could learn how to communicate with them. I'm still a little shaky today. I'm not, I am not fluid in ASL, but what I learned in my time being a student there and learning from my friends who are part of the deaf community is that these members of the community are constantly treated like they're not regular people. They're treated like they're not even human sometimes. And it's so heartbreaking. And I, I witnessed the struggles and the battles that they had every day, just trying to get through their day. And so when I came in to be a council member, um, I knew that this committee existed and I want to do what I can to work with our deaf community here in Riverside. We have a, a fairly large deaf community here in the city of Riverside, and we need to do better to, to make sure that they are connected and also part of the fabric of our community. And only recently, the city started to have ASL interpreters at almost all their events, which is amazing because we need that. So I believe now it's a requirement for the city, whenever we have public forums, I believe we have to have an ASL interpreter. Um, and so that's fantastic and that's a great first step, but we have to do more. And um, that's why I wanted to be part of this committee because I felt that my life experience and having friends um, who I consider family, but having friends who have shared with me their struggles, um, I thought maybe my voice and my presence can make a difference. And so I'm excited to be part of all of these committees at the regional level. And then for my War II committee assignments, um, I currently serve as the chair of the ICGC, um, uh, the Inclusiveness, Community Engagement and Governmental Processes Committee. We refer to it as ICGC because it's a long name. <laughs> I'm also the vice chair of the Financial Performance and Budget Committee. I am a member of the Housing and Homelessness Committee. And just to share with folks, for the first time ever in the City of Riverside history, this is a committee made up of all women. So Councilmember Edwards, Councilwoman Placencia, and myself are all the three members for the Housing and Homelessness Committee. And it's just, I just want to share that because I think it's exciting that we've never had this many women on the council, so we've never had an all council on all woman committee. Um, but I just thought that that might be exciting for some people to know. And then I'm additionally on the mayor's nominating and screening committee, and this is where we actually review applications for people who want to serve on certain commissions when we have to do special appointments. I'm sorry, special interviews, not appointments. I misspoke. And I'm going to take a quick break right there to take a sip of water. And I'm going to go and talk about um, transition into some recent items that I had a, the ability to vote on and um, speak with you about some of the new policies and changes that have come in place. I'm also going to check the time. So I'm going to wrap this up in about five minutes so that we could get to Q&A. And I want to mention the sidewalk vending ordinance um, because we recently had coverage on this. So there was, you know, some coverage in the press enterprise. I saw some things online and I just wanted to share with folks that 
we were able to have this approve a, a new ordinance or update our ordinance um, at our council meeting on Tuesday, September 21st. The ordinance goes into effect at the end of this month. And so currently we are working with our, uh, our county partners and we're working with our code enforcement um, to make sure that once things come into place and that they are approved, we can work with our, our street vendors to get them um, get them permitted so that they are able to legally operate. But just want to make just want to share with folks that you know it was um, it was really interesting to go through the process and hear the conversations and hear the comments from residents. And it, interestingly enough, this was kind of controversial for some folks. Um, we had brick and mortar, small businesses, you know, essentially restaurants that are storefronts who were calling in and sharing with council members that they were, um, they were concerned. They were concerned with this being approved and how it could impact their business. Um, you know, are, are we going to allow for them to, are you going to allow for a, a person who has a taco shop to open up right outside my restaurant and still my customers? And we, you know, we fairly honestly yes listening to the we were fair and honest to listen to those those genuine you know genuine some of them were genuine concerns and others we had to let people know that no that's not at all what we're doing we don't want any of our our current small businesses to fail and that's not what the sidewalk vending policy does and so what i what we were able to do is we set up and put in place restrictions so that um, operators have to stay um, X amount of feet. I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's a certain number of feet that they can't set up next to another business. Um, there are restrictions whenever we have large community events, such as the Festival of Lights right now in downtown. Um, vendors cannot just set up in downtown right now and, and, and try to sell because there's the restrictions we put in place. Um, we did have, we do have limits for how late they can operate. So, uh, in conversation with the Riverside Police Department who had concerns about safety in the evenings, we did limit them to operate until 12 a.m. for the time being, just so that we could um, work with our local police department to make sure that safety wasn't gonna be an ongoing issue. Um, but one of the biggest things and benefits about having an ordinance is that we will be able to increase revenue for the city drastically over the next five years. If you look at other cities who allow for street vendors, I mean, I'm going to make big compare other comparisons to larger cities. I know they're very different, but the city of New York, city of Los Angeles, they are reaping millions of dollars because they have allowed for street vendors to be part of the fabric of their community. Excuse me. And so I think we as a city and as a county, we are going to see um, revenue come in, but we have to work with the street vendors to get them permitted and to make sure that they are, of course, um, following all of our health codes and policies. And I just want to reiterate to folks that there's been questions or concerns are, are they meeting the same standards? Do they still have to do the same, um, meet the same health standards? The answer is yes. There, there are very strict county um, codes that are in place and they will have to meet those health standards. And we're going to be working with, again, the county and our code enforcement community, our, yeah, our code enforcement department um, to make sure that our street vendors are educated on what they need to do so that they could be uh, legally operating on sidewalks. And next slide, excuse me. And I wanna share briefly, I'm gonna cover just on um, our housing element. The city of Riverside, we had a, a meeting October 5th that was very long. <laughs> and we essentially did, a, we approved the general plan 2025 update phase one. This was a huge packet where um, we essentially were doing rezoning and we were approving um, parcels, it, land, spaces that were not currently identified for housing or mixed use development. And we had to go through a whole process for each ward, one, wards one through seven across the entire city to identify spaces that we could build on. Um, the city of Riverside, we have a housing shortage. We have we are not meeting our HUD goals and our numbers. We have been short for years and we are short on affordable housing. We're, sh we're short on market housing. So we have a lot of work to do. And that's partially that's why we had to do our housing element update was so that we could go back to HUD and let them know what we're doing as a city to address our shortage and how how we are going to be identifying locations and places for people to build on. And so I just want to share 
with community that my goals for War II is to increase affordable housing opportunities for all Riversiders. And affordable housing, meaning if that means you want to be a renter, if you want to become a homeowner, I think we have to explore many ways to support residents who want to live and even buy here in the city of Riverside. And another thing that I think that makes me unique is I'm I'm a renter here. I have been renting in Riverside now for almost 10 years and I want to be a homeowner, but it is so hard right now. And homes in Riverside are currently are mark, are listed on the market for over $500,000. I can't afford half a million dollars. So I just want to share with people that I know the struggle of trying to own your home here in the city of Riverside. And it's a dream of mine to live in, to buy a home in War II. I, I, there's different, there's neighborhoods that I'm praying I can be able to live and call my, my home for the future. And so, I, you know, for me, affordable housing is one of the largest things that I've heard from residents when I was going door to door. And it's an important priority of mine. I also want to make sure that we identify new opportunities for mixed use development. Mixed use development is something that could look like you build, um, let's say, a 90 unit uh, three story complex. And the first bottom floor unit could be a small grocery store outlet um, or and then maybe the second floor could be like a child care daycare center and then the rest of the facility is is housing. So mixed use really can change also what we bring into communities so people um, residents don't also if I mean, how I rephrase this so residents as we build housing, then there's going to be more needs we're going to need more grocery stores we're going to need more daycare centers. We're going to need more um, more facilities. So we have to be able to build the environment to address the growth while we while we increase housing. Um, and then the last thing is explore and expand transit oriented development. Um, again, as I mentioned, transportation and public transportation is very important to me. And one of the things that we're moving into and that we're seeing cities across California and even other parts of the nation do is they are trying to figure out how to create their their communities so that people aren't reliant on their cars again. So we're trying to, again, build housing so that people could then use the public transportation, they could use the Metrolink to get to work, but trying to find ways that we don't increase bringing more cars here to the city of Riverside or the Inland Empire for that, for that matter, but trying to see how we can create a built environment that supports people through tra transit-oriented development. And homelessness special workshop. I just want to share with folks that in September we also had um, a debrief with our Office of Homelessness Solutions, and we met with the county to go over our memora memorandum of understanding, which is also known as an MOU. And this was really important because probably aside from housing, the biggest issue I hear from residents is homelessness and how that is severely impacting their quality of life. Um, whether it's people who are on the brink of being homeless or people who are concerned with the safety of maybe issues that have happened in their neighborhood um, or even just other things we've had. I've had residents tell me that they've seen people exposed, you know, in corners and whatnot, and they're afraid of what you know, their kids are being exposed to growing up in the city. So there's a lot of layers to the unhoused, the homelessness crisis that we're facing. Um, I just want to share with folks that I'm going to cut this off a little shorter because I want people to know that. Um, we are doing everything we can. I'm doing everything I can to work with my colleagues on our on our committee and also on the council to make sure that we are working with our county partners, but that we're also holding everyone accountable. And it's literally sometimes going down to line items where we're asking, where is this funding going? Is it working? Can we see the metrics? Can we see the data? So we're constantly going through reports and data to figure out how, what we could do to make things better. And if you ever want to uh, learn or be involved and share comments on um, this issue, please reach out to me at my committee level and I would love to hear from you. I'm gonna jump ahead. I wanted to just share with folks about how we make money through development. Um, here's two brief slides just to mention to you. We have projects coming to the city of Riverside. Development projects drive economic, uh, they generate economic revenue, but they also create jobs. So we also, we have two projects coming in the future that are under development. I just wanted to show these two slides to explain to you kind of how we are able to generate jobs through growth. This is the Canyon Springs Healthcare Center. This is being built over by where the Target and 
the Costco over off Day Street. Um, that is actually still the city of Riverside. A lot of people think it's Myrna Valley, but we have this beautiful senior housing complex that is going to be built. And there's a huge need for senior housing. Um, so I'm excited that we are going to be bringing a total of 690 beds. And this is gonna generate uh, 300 jobs, actually over 800 jobs. And very proud to say that they are working with our local unions. And so we have Layuna and the Carpenters that have, are gonna be on board to help develop this project. And the, what's exciting about that is the people who are part of those unions, a lot of them are, are, River, are Riverside residents. So they get to now work in the city that they live in. So we always like, I like, um, I like to make sure when we're approving development projects that we're working with developers that want to do local hire, that they're focusing on hire local here in the community so that we're not outsourcing and people aren't having to commute from Los Angeles into Riverside. That doesn't make any sense. We need to hire right here in the community if we have the local, the local and skilled workforce to do it. And here's just an, uh, a nice visual of the beautiful map. Well, this is the conclusion of my PowerPoint. Um, one of the things we focus on in War II is art, music, community engagement. We've actually been able to see by doing that, that crime goes down. And so we work closely with the Riverside Police Department to make sure that we're doing whatever we can to keep our neighborhood safe. And I welcome you anytime to the uh, War II, the Ward of Arts and Music. And it is an honor to be your council member. And if you would like, you can follow me on my journey on Instagram, uh, first Cervantes underscore war two. And I wanna thank you School of Public Policy for having me here today. Thank you so much. And thank you again, especially for um, giving some insight to how relevant your family was to your career and a little bit on your inspiration. And a little bit on your inspiration. Uh, additionally, I would like to introduce my fellow classmates who will now be joining me on camera, uh, Uthman Alawi, Kevin Karami, and Alexander Morales, as well as Cam Pollard. Um, they will be posing questions directly to the council member as well as uh, our audience questions. Just a reminder to our audience, please uh, submit your questions through the Q&A feature rather than the chat box. And uh, I'll post your questions to the council member. So uh, just to begin, our first question will be from Kevin Karami. Thanks, Rayon. And thank you, council member uh, Cervantes for your presentation. It was uh, not only informal, I think I learned a lot, but it was also very inspirational um, to hear about your journey and the amazing work that you've done. Um, for my question, I wanted to ask, you focused a lot on community and how community has been a major part of your life and how you think that it can be um, very beneficial for um, everyone, really. Um, that being said, I wanted to ask, given the pandemic and the fact that we haven't really been able to interact with one another um, in a way that we um, used to in the past, um, would you say that, um, I, it's kind of a two-parter, would you say that community involvement and the idea of people coming together to share their ideas, has that taken a hit because of COVID? And then I guess the really important part about it is how do we fix that problem, right? How do we get back to people being able to share their ideas with one another? I know we can still do it virtually, but you know, when you're in person and uh, when you're in person, that factor um, isn't as strong. And so what are your thoughts on people needing to break the barriers that COVID has presented? And how can we get back to community involvement being a major part of our lives? That is a wonderful question. Uh, to be honest, I will say that, yes, I think the pandemic had a huge impact on a lot of people. And I will even just going to say organizations, nonprofits, um, probably the city of Riverside, you know, our government offices. Um, we've worked so hard over the course of the last 10 years to build resident engagement and then COVID hit. And in it, so what I've seen since I came in and what I've heard from folks is, you know, we've had, we have some neighborhood meetings where we probably were having maybe attendance of maybe 15, 20 people. And right now we're at maybe five to 10. So I'd say by we have, we've dropped those active or we've lost probably act those active folks about maybe 50% of them haven't like come back, you know, since now that things are opening up again. 
So we have to find a way to re-engage those people. We have to find a way to reignite that fire of the fuel that was getting them involved to begin with. Um, one thing that I love to say, and there's a quote that I live by, it's my Maya Angelou, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget the way that you made them feel. And so I live by that quote, and I believe that it is my responsibility to ignite people to feel something that inspires them to be involved, that gives them a reason to say, I want to show up and I want to be part of this. And I think that part of how you do that is by doing what we're doing right now, having a conversation, talking to each other, looking at each other eye to eye. And I've even found that we can make a connection through Zoom. Like you can have a connection over the internet, but nothing compares to that in-person um, human experience, right? And so I really, I'm excited to be able to get back to the, we, we've now been having meetings again in person and I could see the light it brings out of residents when they meet with me in person versus when they meet with me virtually. But I think no matter what, the best thing you could always do is give people your time and give them your, your care and let them know that you really are listening to them. Um, because then that let, that leaves them with, I want to come back here. You know, I, I know that my presence makes a difference because that person told me <laughs> or because, you know, X, Y, Z. So I just think that that's part of how I approach it. But I do think that there's a lot of work that we're going to have to do across the board. And that's why it's great when we have people who are active and, ex and excited and inspired to want to get people involved. We need you. Like, we need you to be the, the feelers who, like, ignite and pull people in. So um, if you're out there, come, come help us out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for your response and uh, how to combat that kind of apathy. Uh, next up, we have our first audience question from Kevin Dawson. Um, he's interested in good governance. How does a city avoid becoming a city of a uh, city of Bell scandal or a scandal of our Ontario Unified School District or the one of City of Merino Valley where they continue to pay their retired city manager after retirement? Mm. You know, I've hi Kevin. Good to see. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think good governance, it really, it's interesting. We're, I'm currently, we're going through a process right now um, on the, the, in, the government, um, the title is so long, I can't even remember it, the Intergovernmental Processes Engagement Committee Engagement Committee. Um, we are going through a process right now, actually, it's our board, of, it's our board, we have a board of ethics for the city, and we're currently going through the board of ethics, the, how do I say it? I'm losing my words, excuse me. Um, we have language. Essentially, we're going through the, the language of what, how do we hold electeds and in general, maybe even board members or representatives of the city accountable when if they do something that isn't an unethical or if they do, we do something that, you know, essentially we shouldn't or maybe it's out of line. Um, we abuse our power or something like that. We have don't really have a, we have a process in place, but that process has been. I don't know, it's my choice of words to say, we have to do better, I guess. There's, there's something that we could do to improve that process because right now, let me put it this way, there's a process in place. I don't think it's actually making a difference or being effective the way it was intended to be. So we are trying to figure out right now, how can we improve that process so that there is good governance and that we are holding people accountable if they do violate the charter or if, we, if I violate the Brown Act, I would, I would think my colleagues in the community should hold me accountable. And I think that's kind of, we need to have residents. I just want to mention this to folks too. It, it is our responsibility to show up and to do the best that we can as your elected representatives. And I'm all for my community holding me accountable um, because I think that that's how we have good leaders and who ultimately are, are here to do the right thing. And unfortunately, we, that's not always the case. Sometimes the best people, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, some people are elected and they don't have the best interests of the collective. And then it takes community residents, people like Kevin Dawson, who are like showing up and saying, no, you know, this isn't right. No, I don't know if, you know, did you, Kevin is wonderful where he'll text and he'll ask me questions and ask me and follow up with me on things that I voted on. And 
I have to be able to have and know within my truth why I took a vote, a position on something. Otherwise, I probably I shouldn't be here. <laughs> you know, I need to be able to know why I am making decisions on things that I am. And I'll be honest, I'm probably not always going to make a right decision I'm, I'm, or a decision that's going to make everyone happy. But as long as I'm able to honor and know that I make a decision within my moral, my ethics and within whatever I swore to, you know, when we, when I swore into office, that is my compass. And so um, by making sure that we also have transparency, so we have a transparent Riverside now, I think we still have more work we could do there too. So that commu community can know that they can trust us. And I think that's a big part is that there has been trust lost between government and residents. And we have to acknowledge that. We have to acknowledge that we haven't always had honest directors. We haven't always had honest electeds, honest people who are going to give it straight forward and tell you what it is. People have tried to cover up sometimes things. It's, it's this, these things exist in government. And if we're not willing to admit that, then I think we're going to be part of the problem. So I just want to share to Kevin and the audience that, you know, I think I'm not afraid to um, admit when something's wrong or even when something feels wrong. And it's up to us to make sure that we speak up and we stand up when something is right. Thank you so much um, for your response about remaining ethical after being in that kind of position. And I think next up, we have a question from one of our SPP students. Uh, Cam, uh, take it away, please. Thank you, Miriam. And thank you, Councilmember Cervantes. Your entire presentation was so inspiring. I love seeing your passion with you talking about everything that you're working on for the city of Riverside. It really is. Um, I, what stood out to me the most was when you talked about transportation. I'm from the Bay Area, so I'm used to really a lot of transportation and not necessarily needing a car either. Um, and I, part of the reason like for me pushing to get a car was moving out here to Riverside because the transportation has just not been the greatest um, to get around. Um, I, had, I was wondering um, how you were envisioning to making the transportation more improved, especially given the pandemic. Will it look differently? Will we have like more codes on limits on buses? Um, what are your thoughts and um, with the health concerns as well? Yes, thank you. And that is such a good question. And I'll be honest, it's something I recently have been thinking about. I've, I've been actually thinking, how are we going to get back? How are we going to get back to ridership? Just so, just so you, everyone who ever listening knows, um, Riverside Transit Agency was doing what was was actually increasing ridership from twenty. It was 2014 or 15 to 20, the, when I was still working with the city, 2016, 2017, um, when I went into to get my master's, part of my research that I came, I invested in was actually looking into the various public transportation systems. Um, I did research comparing OCTA, Orange County Transit, San Diego Transit, um, Los Angeles Transit, and Riverside Transit, so and San Bernardino, Omnitrans. So I have studied and explored um, the ridership numbers for public transportation for, for those regions. And it was fascinating to me at the time to see how there was a trend happening where it was going upwards. People were actually starting to ride the bus. And then I was, at the time, I would ride the bus um, from Canyon Crest. I would hop on sometimes Sycamore, come go down to Canyon Crest, and then I'd hop, stay on, and I'd go up to UCR, and then I'd come down University into downtown. And whenever I would get on the bus at the Canyon Crest stop, it would get filled with students, like jam packed. It was like, oh my God, I can't find a seat. Oh my God, I can't breathe. <laughs> and then it, everyone would unload at like campus and then it'd be kind of a nicer, like quieter, like or a, a more roomier ride <laughs> for the rest of the way. But it, what's so sad and shocking to see is that stop right now, if you get on it, it's not full and it's not right, like overwhelmed with students and who are using the bus right now. And I think COVID had a big part of that. Um, my, my kind of sadness or frustration with what, what is then and what is now. Back then, several, back then, several years ago, we have still so much of a stigma around public transportation. People view public transportation as, and I know this because I've actually done research on this, people um, have stigmas or these thoughts that public transportation are for people who are low income. 
people who are homeless, people who are, have maybe been incarcerated or who have, you know, a background or maybe, maybe someone who's had a, a DUI. Like, there's this notion that if you go on the bus, that you're not just an average resident using the bus, which is really, again, it's so bizarre to me, but we as again, society have an, at least California society or Southern California mentality, because it's not Northern, but in Southern California, we've created this, like, is this mindset that having a car is the only way to really live. And if you don't have a car, then, and if you are relying on public transportation, then you fall into this other niche and that's nowhere near the truth. And I think that's where, for me at that time, I was already kind of frustrated with like trying to figure out how do we break the mold of the, of that mindset? And I found out we have to get to, we have to get to people basically when they're in, in elementary school, you have to get to kids before they're even drivers, because we have to plant the seed in their mind that public transportation is amazing, that this is, this is the way to do it. This is how you, we solve climate change. This is how we address, you know, X, Y, Z. Cause if we take that approach, then people are like, oh yeah, I want to be part of the difference. But the problem now, and put it, I'm actually very like what, what I'm sad about is now COVID is actually to me added another layer of fear. Now people don't want to ride the bus because of proximity of space of, you know, touching the, the bars or the seats. So I'm actually kind of, I'm hoping it, it doesn't have even more consequences on ridership. I think it's going to for a little while until we, until maybe vaccination rates are higher, or maybe until um, we just get, we get more out of more time has to pass. But I think in general, we have to get to our community and to our, our pretty much people before their drivers, we have to get to our youth and we have to be able to let them know that they don't have to be part of the car culture. Let's cancel the car culture. Let's cancel the cars. <laughs> And let's get them to be part of the new generation that is that is promoting public transportation and is promoting, you know, how to move through society in different ways so that we can transform our air and our climate communities. And I think we could get there, but it's going to take a collective effort. Thank you so thank much you. for your response and definitely a very powerful solution to a very prominent issue. And thank you for giving us insight on a on an example of a policy that um, that we need change and have COVID has dramatically impacted. Um, next up, we have a anonymous attendee who is asking, what advice do you have for students that are interested in the career in urban planning? Where should we start or what should we do or what should we go knowing into that career? I love that, yes. Well, you know what's interesting? I would share with folks, no one tells you when you're younger that you could grow up and be an urban planner. I don't know why. <laughs> and I just want everyone to know you can be an urban planner. You can plan your communities. And, you know, if even if, um, yeah, just it, it's thing for myself, I never knew that this profession existed, you know, or that was an avenue that you could go down. And I learned later on when I looked into the statistics, um, less than, less than at the time it was a couple of years ago, 1% of women across the nation or planners and Latinx. So when you look at the statistics and you look at who's actually planning communities, we don't have a lot of diversity. We don't have a lot of you, you know, diverse representation. Um, it's a male dominated field. So we definitely need more women, um, LGBTQ+, they, them, however you identify, we just, we need more diversity and representation of planners. Um, and I think that the field has, intentionally not told people, women, or, and a lot of folks that this field exists, because think about it, if urban planning, or just, so, just so everyone knows, urban planning is linked to everything. It's linked to community development. It's linked to neighborhoods. It's linked to zoning. And zoning is attached to business development, economic development. So if you are, and then, and then planning is actually almost all political <laughs> because you can't get anything approved unless you go through your local jurisdictions, whether it's your county, your city, your state. So actually by the, in the roles that you're in in public policy, there is gonna be some ways and sometimes that you're gonna come across some type of urban planning or some type of way that's gonna link you to, um, yeah, or, or regional planning. And so I think 
that's why for myself, um, I'll just share with folks, take a class. You know, if I don't know how your, your profession or your degree works, if you're able to take um, different units or alternatives, but if you have the ability to take elective, that's what I was going for, if you could take electives, if you have the ability to take an elective in an urban planning class, I highly recommend that you just give that an opportunity to see what happens or what you think or how you feel about it. Um, because in urban planning, here's the thing too, there's environmental planning, there's climate change planning, there's activist planning, there's, um, so, there's housing planning, housing development. So the, when I went into planning too, I'm just thinking urban regional planning is like the arching umbrella. And then I went in and then I had uh, professors who were saying, so what do you wanna focus on? And then I found out there was transportation policy and planning. And I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is what I want to do. <laughs> and so just to share with folks, there's so many different issues and subjects that you could actually fall into and you could become an expert on. And right now, the top jobs, just so you guys, here's another kicker I would recommend how you could get involved or to say to explore the number one jobs currently being created right now in our economy are related to transportation, they're related to environmental, um, and they're also related to, well, essentially urban planning, creating communities. So, I mean, that is right now one of the top fields that is being created. So if you pursue something along these lines, or if you seek it out, you may actually could become, you know, fall into the, a field that is booming right now and that needs people. We need the, the next generation of forward thinkers of innovators to be the ones to help guide and dream of, of the communities that we want to live in. And the part about planning too, I, I read a quote that I loved and it says, dreaming is a form of planning. So if you think about it in that aspect that if you are able to have a seat, a voice at the table and you are literally drawing the community, how powerful is that? If you're literally getting to help guide and navigate the conversations on what's best for the residents and the communities, how powerful is that? That is another form of public policy in action, in place. When you are at the table and you are, you are making a difference with zoning, with amendments and variances. I mean, it all, all these different, these are all planning words, but all these things come up and they change how we are able to live. And so uh, I would just recommend to anyone, if there's any interest um, you could always also serve as an intern. So a lot of cities have a lot of internships and they actually don't even require you to have a planning background. Sometimes they want to just know that you have interest in it and they will give you an opportunity to be an intern. So I would say you could always look into your cities to see, or even um, you could re look to see if any uh, local, I'm trying to think, I know different architect groups will put out like calls for like, if you want to be like work in their office as well, but I would say look at your local cities, look at your local um, your local counties and see if there's any internship opportunities or just take an elective, take a class if you have the opportunity. Um, what I did is I went online and I kind of just did some basic research to see if what, what part of planning interests me. And then I was able to find Cal Poly Pomona, I found the program and the rest is history. Thank you so much for your response and giving that um, very crucial advice uh, for those who might be interested in urban planning. Um, next up, we have a comment and a question from audience member Semi Cole. He says, Council member Clarissa Cervantes, I love your authenticity and the courage you have to share your truth. Your remarks on good governance and the need for community connection is inspiring. Today is the six year anniversary of the heartbreaking shooting of San Bernardino. How can we ensure that our work continues in uplifting and supporting our fellow Riversiders, that the success and the community advances over and spills into the larger England empire? Thank you for that question. Um, very sorry, just to say, like, sending prayers and love to all who were impacted and continue to be impacted by the loss that we had in the San Bernardino shooting. Um, I have a friend I went to high school with, actually, who um, a best friend of hers was one of the victims. And I will always remember the day I opened Instagram and saw her, her post, and it was just heartbreaking to, to know how much pain she was in. Um, but I'll share for myself that, and thank you for that remark to the, to the member of the audience. I appreciate your comment. Um, one of the things that I've learned is, especially over the course of the last two, three years has been the power of movements and the power of a collective when a collective has said, we've had enough and we can't go another day living this way. 
And we've come together as communities and even whether it's the Women's March or whether it's um, the, I'm trying to remember the organization. It was, it's the, the movement, the guns movement. Um, there's a group, there's a group of students of youth that organized it. I just can't remember right now the, the name of the movement, but there was a specific group that was out marching and protesting after many, another, you know, we have countless senseless shootings that are taking place still to this day across the nation. And so the unity, what I have found and being able to go out and I love, I think it's so beautiful when, when groups march together, when we walk together and when you hear the chants and the voices of your brothers and sisters on the ground. And when you're saying the names of people who should have never passed away. And when you hear the beat drums of the indigenous communities who are hitting their drums, I often show up in those spaces with sage. And I will actually sage community and um, bless them for what they're feeling and to clear their energies, you know, from the heaviness, because that's something that too, that we don't often talk about is the heaviness that we feel when we feel like we're helpless. Like, why is this happening? And why, why can't we do something? Or why is no one doing anything about it? And that's why I think when we show up and when we don't let that heaviness carry us down to think that nothing's ever going to change, but instead we carry ourselves out to show up somewhere, whether we're protesting, whether we're advocating for something, whether we're standing as a group in unity, um, or whether you're doing a sit-in or whether you're just participating in a rally, by being there and by feeling the energy, it's like going to a concert. By being in an energy of people who have shared similar, similar values as you, like-minded, concerns and who are pretty much saying I couldn't stay home today because I care too much and I just can't take another day it makes a difference and we've seen how movements have made a difference for actions across the nation for what's happening you know some states are some states are battling voter suppression laws right now and we've seen people show up in drones to fight that um so there's a lot that happens across the country but even in our own cities in the inland empire and there has been times that we've been called as community to take action. And I just want to encourage people when you feel the feelings I'm talking about, you know, don't don't let that pull you down. Instead, it let that be the fire that ignites you to say, I want to be part of the change. And remember, like myself, I was a little girl once thinking I missed the boat. I was I was God. I didn't get to be part of it all. You're here for a reason right now, today. You are meant to be part of the change that's happening now because the injustices are still existing in this moment. They didn't go away. If anything, they were masked for a temporary time. And it's our responsibility to be the generations and to have to nurture the next generation to know that we can uproot this and that we can change the course of history, but it takes the collective. And that's part of why I think that I was elected is because I believe that the collective of this community saw me and knew that I was going to be relentless in uprooting the issues that are rooted in our city government, probably what Kevin Dawson was referring to. <laughs> but, you know, it's our responsibility if we see something wrong to say something. It's our responsibility if we feel like something isn't okay, that we see how we can make it better for others. And that's where I think the power of being an active citizen has the ability to transform communities in ways that government never knew was possible. And that's what I'm here to do. Thank you so much for your response. Uh, next up, we have another audience question from Jem Montes. He asks, what is the Riverside doing to address the pollution and pollution generators that continue to burden our community? Warehouses, high-speed rails, diesels, et cetera. Great question. Um, or I will say that our state legislator and our Governor have been taking very active measures and approaches to pass bills and legislation to address that very issue. Um, we now, as a city and as War II, are the home of the California Air Resources Board, CARB, which is located off Iowa and University, well, off Iowa Avenue, but the other cross streets university, right outside the footsteps of UCR. Um, but CARB is essentially meant to be one of the, the lead, uh, you know, essential governance that is going to help address climate here in the Inland Empire, how we're going to fix the, the, the monster of the air quality 
that we've allowed to get to this point because of the goods movement that moves through Inland Empire that comes from Long Beach, that comes from the ports and then goes out into the rest of the nation and provides those the, the goods that you know people are saying that we that they need. But it's like that's at a compromise of the health of this entire region. And so we need to do, and this is also this is also where I, my transportation kind of came in because it's also all linked to transportation. <laughs> and so there's a lot of work and a lot of layers that need to be done. And I've I would love in the future if we actually would want to have another uh, seminar and we could focus on, you know, air quality or environmental issues impacting an empire and what we're going to do as a city um, and what what War II is going to be working on. But part of what I mentioned and I covered was the TCC grant, that California Strategic Growth Council grant for $30 million, that is actually intended to help uh, reduce our, our, uh, air, our CO2 emissions. That is intended to that is intended to reduce our carbon footprint. That is intended to make a difference so that our air quality is able to be better. So there are currently investments already being poured into War II so that we can start to turn the needle and go the right direction. But it's going to take us working hard to make sure that there we continue to hold down the moratorium on the north side. There is currently a moratorium in place to not develop warehouses on the north side of Riverside and. Um, we have another development project being proposed, actually coming next this month, a, a hearing for a warehouse project in War II down in Sycamore Canyon. And one of the biggest things right now I'm asking them is, what are you going to do with all those trucks? How are we going to, uh, how are we going to deal with the air quality that's going to come in with 250 trucks every day? And it's, these are the things that we have to be responsible for as leaders when we make votes and decisions and we have to be willing to ask people hard questions. And that's currently a project right now that I'm, I'm going to be I'm facing. So just to let people know that um, I'm here to serve and to work with you and I would love to actually hear from res from students on that project. So um, please send in your public comment input on uh, the development project, the warehouse project that's being proposed in Sycamore Canyon. We're going to have two neighborhood meetings next next week on it. I will send um, your student leaders the information. So if any of you want to come out and learn about that project and give input, I would love to have you there. Thank you so much for your response and um, how you address uh, some of these pollution generators that are um, in our government. Um, so next, uh, I'm confining uh, two audience member questions because they might be a little bit related and we do seem to be running a little low on time. So what do you suggest students start doing on firsthand to get firsthand experiences inside of the community if they hope to run for council member? Um, especially, uh, how can we get involved in local government? How can yes. students, oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. Just No, I got excited. <laughs> Um, how can students contact for an opportunity for an internship at the city council member's office? Wonderful. That's a great question. So I'll be quick with this. We have two minutes. Um, just to share. Yes, I was so excited. Sorry, I didn't let you finish. Um, please get involved. We actually have open commission seats right now. So for War II, I have a couple open commission seats. So ways to be involved is if you actually live in the city of Riverside, um, you are able to apply to be on one of our commissions. And so I highly encourage, uh, depending on what ward, you, what ward you live in, you could apply to be on our Budget Engagement Commission. Um, we have our Human Relations Commission. We have, we have a number of commissions, but there are different ways that you can be involved. And so I highly encourage you, if you want to start to learn and get involved in the level, even to attend or watch the committee meetings, um, the commissions are always great so that you could just start to learn, is this something I want to be a part of? Am I interested in this? Um, so those are great ways. Your local student government, I know some of those who may, you are all involved in your local student government, but this is a great insight and great way to start learning about community. But I would really encourage you to come and attend your neighborhood meetings. Join us for the university neighborhood meeting. Join us for the east side neighborhood meeting. Um, come on out because at those meetings, we cover a lot of different city issues, different projects coming up, what are, updates on other things that are happening in the, in the area. And it gives you an insight into how you can get involved let me put it this way, we always have events that you could volunteer at, be part of. We have the Eastside Hill Zone. And if any of you wanna be involved in, in that aspect, um, please head, reach out to my office. But 
there are a lot of ways uh, we're doing tree planting just so that you guys know we're going to be planting over 1,000 trees in the east side in war two the next year so if you want to come out and help us with planting trees and being able to say i was part of the program that helped to grow trees in war two you know there's a lot of ways that we would love for you to be involved um I, we just accepted a new intern into our office from ucr her name is Zelia, and we're thrilled to have her she just started two weeks ago um, but you know when Zelia rotates out i think we're gonna have her with us for a few months please reach out to my office you can even reach out to us now to put your um we can get you put your name through the process so if you want to intern with my office or even another office we can get you set up to go through that process um, we do have several students who reach out and who go through interview process and we always try to find a place for students if we're able to. So I just encourage you, honestly, at almost every level of our government, you could learn so much. Um, so just want to say that, like, I have to see, a, a, yes, Kevin Dawson made a great, great point. He said there are different city boards and committee meetings that are watched and taped online. It's always good to watch them before applying for a position. Again, just lets you kind of really think, do I really want to do this? And know that some of our commission meetings, they'll be like three or four hours. And so always good to know if you can have the time commitment. That's one of the biggest things, making sure you have the, you can make the commitment. Um, but we've had, I've had UCR students that graduated or even some during that were appointed to like our airport commission, our transportation board commission. So, you know, we've had in the past students who have applied and who have been able to be appointed. Um, it's always great. We try to look at people's experience to see, you know, if, if we feel that you're a good fit. But I always want to encourage you to, if you apply for something and if you don't get it, keep applying. Just keep applying for more things. And, um, and also, there are fellowships to be able to go to uh, Washington, D.C., Sacramento. I know a number of students, and I'm honored. I've had the privilege of being able to write letters of recommendations for a number of people who have been accepted into the Capitol Fellows, the State Fellows, the Assembly Fellows. Those are great ways to be to learn policy legislation and just learn firsthand what's happening in, in the district offices, at the Capitol offices, and you get to see firsthand experience. So I encourage you to go many routes, follow what calls to your soul, and just keep honoring that, and then you will end up in the place that you're supposed to be. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for the questions. At this point in time, we have uh, reached the end of today's event. I just want to express the School of Public Policy's deepest gratitude to Council Member Clarissa Cervantes for taking the time out of what I'm sure is her very busy schedule to join us today. Um, we'd love to have you back in the future, hopefully for another seminar, perhaps on uh, air pollution, as you mentioned. Um, thank you so much again for all your time and work. Thank um, you so much. Yeah, of course. It was our pleasure having you. Um, a special thanks as well to the students and the planning committee um, for this event. Uthman Alawi, Cam Pollard, and uh, thank you for your work. Thank you so much. Thank you all. It is an honor and a privilege to represent you. Thank you, Kevin. I saw his comment, present, my presentation. And to any residents listening and tuning in and the community leaders, um, thank you. It's This is... Uh, I never knew I was going to be here, honestly, and there probably were days and times I didn't know where my life was going to lead me, but I'm so honored to to be able to say that I represent more too, and um, this is my full time commitment and I'm I'm here to serve and to listen and to be here as a support so please if you ever have any questions if you need guidance if you want to have coffee know that you can reach out to me and we can always schedule a time. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, council member. Um, also to those who may be watching uh, on a later date, we hope you'll join us at our next event online um, Wednesday on California Governor, um, Governor Gavin Newsom's appointment secretary, Catherine Rivera will be giving a seminar on about how to serve on state and board commission. Um, or you can learn more about events hosted by the UCR School of Public Policy like these by visiting our website at spp.ucr.edu. While you're there, you can also learn about our Masters of Public Policy program, as well as our new BA MPP program. Thank you all for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at future SPP events.